Well, they're going to debate that for a long time, but it is in the laws of the game. The laws of the game state that if she's in her delivery stride and the non-striker leaves her crease, you can be run out at the non-striker's end. Charlie Dean ends in tears. And remember, it is in the laws of the game. That's the sound of a so-called man-cad dismissal, ending a thrilling game of women's cricket between India and England. For the uninitiated, the man-cad, or non-strikers run-out, is one of the hottest, most fiercely contested, divisive debates in cricket. It's in the laws of the game, yet many argue it's not in the spirit. Despite its apparent taboo, we're seeing the dismissal performed with ever-growing frequency at every level. What do we know about the man who the act is named after? Why does it elicit such visceral reactions? And are we on a path to adoption, normalisation and destigmatisation? I'm Patrick Stack. This is ABC Sport Daily. Robert Crash Craddock writes on cricket for the Brisbane Courier Mail. You've likely seen him on TV or heard him on radio. He's been covering cricket in this country for decades. Crash, I want to start with the man. Who is Vinu Mankad and why is he intrinsically linked with the action? Well, Vinu Mankad was an outstanding Indian all-rounder who toured Australia just after the war and he started the Mankad movement. It wasn't then, it was just one man doing his best when he twice ran out Australia's Bill Brown, who backing up too far. Now, Pat, Bill was a former sprinter and he, he was really the first batsman who made an art form out of backing up. And he dawdled out of his crease. Mancad gave him a couple of warnings, but Bill was so hard wired into backing up, he couldn't change his habits. And he was run out once in a tour game, and another time in a test. And in Melbourne, when he was run out in a test, he looked over his shoulder and he thought, I wonder who threw that ball. Someone from the covers. Guess who it was? Vinu Mancad. I understand you actually lived near Bill Brown, Mankad's original victim, as you touch on. Did you ever talk to him about his views? Because what I find really interesting in the reading I've done is the lack of outrage at the time. Even Sir Donald Bradman seemed to be fine with it. What was Bill Brown's account of things? Yeah, he lived just around the corner from me in Yolumba Street, Castle Dine. And just before his death, uh, we I used to go to his place for dinner about three times a year and I asked him about it and he said, look, when I got home from the ground, the, the biggest critic I found was my wife, Barbara, who said, what were you thinking? And he said, I said, that's the trouble. I wasn't. I, I was just drifting off mentally. And he said, but it divided Australia. There was letters to the editor's column where people would say, how dare Vinu Mankad do that? And, and others sticking up for him, such as Bradman who rang Bill Brown and said, look, I'm going into bat for Mancad because I believe he did nothing wrong. So Bill thought, Pat, that he would settle this. So at the team hotel in Melbourne, they were both staying at the same hotel. He rang up Mancad and said, come down to the bar, Venu, and let's just have a chat and a drink. You know, let's just settle this. And Venu said, Bill, I won't come for a drink with you, but I'll never do it again. Bill never held it against Mancad in any way. He said, it was my fault. I should have been in the crease. But it was just interesting. In the year about 2000, Bill got a knock on his door in Castle Dine in Brisbane, and it was Mancad's son, Ashok. And Ashok said, look, Bill, I've come from Calcutta, all the way from there, and I just want to have morning tea with you and say that, you know, I hope there's no hard feelings, and you know, Dad was a good man, and, you know, he had mixed feelings about what happened. And Bill said, oh, Ashok, not at all. Gosh, he said it was my fault. So peace. There was peace between the two families, and it was really nice that it finished that way, Pat. There might have been peace between the two families, but I feel like it's been a far from peaceful conversation in the broader cricket community. There's been instances since that original man cad by Vinu. It lay dormant largely until the last decade. Why do you think, for some, it's returned to fashion? Because of white ball cricket and the knowledge that every centimetre matters, there's so many strands of the game now to T20, you know, there's T10 leagues, and it's just the forensic analysis of bowlers' front feet. Oh, my goodness. A reprieve. It's a no ball. He's overstepped. What a reprieve. It creates the contrast, doesn't it? When bowlers can be one millimetre over and get called for no balls and batsmen can be halfway down the pitch and get away with it. So bowlers have had enough. They've had enough of rules of the game 
conspiring against them. And Pat, can I say this? I've actually jumped the fence on it. And what transitioned me was a first-class umpire who said, oh, mate, <laughs> he said, it's funny when you look down at the bowl increase because you're concentrating so hard on whether the guy's stepping over the line. That's with your left eye. He said, and out the corner of your right eye, you see some batsman halfway to Sydney Heads. You know what I mean? He's gone. He's off and gone. You don't worry about him. He said, it seems unfair. And you know what? It is unfair. I'm interested in that idea of the spirit of the game because we know it's within the laws of the game and enemies of the man cab will suggest it's not in the spirit. Yet, as you sort of touch on, it's only in play if batters are leaving the crease early. Why is it that batters illegally gaining an advantage seems to be, inverted commas, in the spirit, but exposing that deception is not so? Well, you know what, Pat? You just, you're 100% right. I mean, that's right. Like, He's taking the legal advantage in the spirit of the game. I mean, that's what batsmen are effectively doing. It's touch and go there. I'm not a fan of this. I have to say I'm not a fan. Just because they know they can. Like Tinas De Bruyne, the South African guy, was virtually daring Mitchell Stark to run him out. He, he couldn't get it. He said, you're not going to remove those bales. So stay in your crease. It's not that hard. Why is there for a reason, mate? Well, you know, bowlers have had enough. I mean... I saw Dan Christian threaten a man cab the other night after three closely run twos. A little, little, uh, just make sure you've got on the line. That's just check it. Well, he was. That's your warning, mate. And each time, it was a close finish, and, and he'd probably taken a bit of an advantage at the bowler's end in backing up. So I really get it from bowler's perspective, and I think in 10 years' time, it will be normalised. It certainly uh, does feel like it's becoming more and more common. It's such a hot conversation, despite that fact. We're seeing it being executed more and more. And I was interested to see Adam Zampa try it in the BBL. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Adam Zampa has made a big decision here. The opposition berated him. Mm. The commentators didn't rate it. doesn't matter which side of your fence you sit on. It's not a good look at any cricket. He wasn't worried. As you sort of touch on, does all of this tell you that we're on the path to a normalisation? Uh, I, I wouldn't say normalisation. I'd say more normal. I, it will always be a chastening and conflicting moment for the game. It doesn't look pretty. We can't pretend that. However, you know, I saw one in the under-19 World Cup in South Africa and a girl from Rwanda was run out by a Pakistan fast bowler and it was as normal as you can get. The Pakistan fast bowler just ran her out and tossed the ball in the air as if she was throwing a stone over her shoulder. Well, if you've got a rule, you've got a cushion, you can opt for it. I thought that's a step forward for the Mancad movement because... It was so nonchalant, it wasn't funny. So I think for the kids of today growing up, it will be far more normal than it was for old fogies like myself, who for 30 years said, oh, man, cab was a bad experience. And uh, But as I said, Pat, I've jumped the fence. If you're a batsman, you're silly enough to wander out of your crease after all these warnings. Well, you get what's coming to you. And that's the sort of final question I want to finish on. Why do you think this particular act draws such a feverish response? Why does it elicit such visceral emotions in cricket followers? Great question, because I think cricket has always had a spirit to it. Uh, a sort of, uh, you go through the front door for your cricket dismissals, you know, your LBW and, and stuff like that. And cricket's a game where deception is supposed to be associated with, you know, wrist spin bowling or, or you know, late reverse swing but not the run out at the bowler's end. So it's part of the charm of the game, Pat. It really is. It's why a lot of us love the game, because it does have that sacred, unexplainable charm. I mean, there's no reason for it, isn't it? And sometimes that's the best spiritual things, but there's no reason for it. You just do it. But the mood is turning. Bowlers have had enough. White ball cricket is a game of centimetres and millimetres. Every centimetre matters. Bowlers have been judged so harshly with their no balls. They get nothing. So I get it. It's just the times are changing. I don't love watching it, Pat, but it will be more and more regular in our lives. Crash Craddock, thanks so much for your time. We appreciate it. It's my absolute pleasure. Thanks, Pat. Vinu Mankad may have brought the dismissal into cricketing consciousness, 
but he wasn't even close to the first to try it. Friend of the show, Gideon Haig, reached out to remind us that New South Wales' Nat Thompson executed the dismissal as far back as 1866 when his side was playing Victoria. So just in case any of us are trying to point the finger at our friends from India, it seems as though Australian cricketers might have popularised the practice much, much sooner. I'm Patrick Stack. This is ABC Sport Daily, produced by Poppy Penny. For more on the Man Cat, I'd highly recommend Kyle Pollard's excellent piece. It's on the ABC website, and I've thrown the link in the show notes. Thanks to Channel 7, Channel 9, Fox Cricket, Fan Code, and the Australian Open for the extra audio used in this episode. Hit subscribe for more, or try out the ABC Listen app for thousands of other podcasts, all ad-free.